Well, hello, our fellow friends, our fellow neighbors, and our fellow Shining Stars. Our next trolley stop is here. Our next trolley stop is now. Welcome back to another all-new episode of PR from the Hearts Children's Book Spotlight Series. To be precise, we have reached episode number 202. That is the 202nd trolley stop. Here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series here at PR From the Heart, my name is John Massalonis, the manager of PR From the Heart and the host of the Children's Book Spotlight Series. But joining me, as always, is my faithful furry friend and companion, Little Force. He reminds me when I do the intros in the program, he says, John, we fly together on this. So I am your co-host. We're in this journey that is called life together in the process. We are super excited to spend some time with all of you, wherever you are, wherever you may be, for all of our new friends and neighbors who are joining our neighborhood. We really appreciate you spending some quality time with us here because it is one of our favorite times of the year. It is spring. And of course, when we celebrate spring, we celebrate new life. And it's interesting because for some time now, you see this artwork that's behind me that's courtesy of one of our dear friends and neighbors and one of the proud members of the PR from the Heart family, one of our favorite clients, John Para. And in life, in many respects, it's always about planting seeds, right? And there's times where we're wondering when those seeds will flourish and when the harvest will take place. And so when we take the time to, you know, go to the grocery store and we see all of the different things we see, the green beans and the cabbage and the carrots. And sometimes we can take that for granted because it's just there, right? And then simultaneously on the flip side of things, when things flourish for us in our lives, we can take for granted all of the hard work that was put in along the way, all of those sleepless nights or times where we experience a little bit of frustration or confusion along the way. There's a very powerful story that we're going to be sharing here today because it is the time of spring and spring has sprung here on the Children's Book Spotlight series. But we're doing our part to not only harvest crops, of course, with it being the springtime, but thanks to one of our newest neighbors here at PR From the Heart in the Children's Book Spotlight series, together, individually and collectively, we're going to be harvesting hope. We encourage all of you, again, our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and of course, our fellow shining stars, to head on over to the official website of our featured guest here on the Children's Book Spotlight series for our brand new Trolley Stop episode number 202. We've included his official website in the description below. We also encourage you to head on over to Amazon.com if that's your preferred online vehicle of your choosing, and you can purchase your copy of The Last Stand. It is now available, courtesy of our friends and neighbors at Penguin Random House. One of the many ways that you can pledge your support for Antoine Edie is to leave a five-star review for The Last Stand. That's just one of the many ways you can pledge your support to let him know that he's doing wonderful and magical work for children, parents, families, educators, and as we like to say, those who love great children's books. So, of course, as you know, the trolley's been racking up a lot of mileage going across the country and around the world. The trolley's out here in San Diego. We go all the way across the country to the beautiful state, dare I say the majestic area of Savannah, Georgia, joining us for his first time on the Children's Book Spotlight Series, award-winning children's author, Antoine E., spending some quality time with myself and Little Forest. Antoine, it's great to meet new neighbors along the path. Thank you for spending some quality time with us. How are things with you today? And happy spring to you. Thank you. Happy spring. The pollen is here for sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me and congrats on 201 episodes. That is amazing. And uh, before this interview, I've been listening to a few of them and I just love what you're doing. So thank you so much for having me. I've been doing well. It's been a beautiful time with the release of The Last Stand, which I know we'll dive into today. Uh, it's been a beautiful time to meet readers that have, um, you know, I've sat with this book for almost three to four years now. So having it be out in the world, I'm, I'm excited about it. We definitely have a lot to be able to dive into. For many of you who have been with us here for the past five and a half years, or for those who are new to our neighborhood, of course, one of the many ways that you can pledge your support if you already haven't had the opportunity to do so. If you are enjoying this trolley stop thus far, if you're feeling a, li a little hungry, if you say, you know what, I'm gonna cook myself some vegetables and you know make a little stir fry on top of it, right? We encourage you to subscribe to PR From the Heart's official YouTube channel and to share this very special trolley stop that you are now enjoying on your favorite social media platforms of your choosing. Again, that is episode number 202 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. By subscribing to our official YouTube channel, you can join the more than 10,000 subscribers 
for our YouTube channels. We like to say the proud members of the PR from the heart family. Um, Antoine, again, a lot to be able to dive into with this book. And it's fascinating because I remember I first was introduced to your work through Nigel and the Moon. You know, spend some time going to many of the Barnes and Nobles throughout the San Diego area. We'll put a pin in the Nigel and the Moon thread and we'll circle back with that in the process. We always start off every children's book spotlight series. I love connecting with, with people's origin stories. And it always begins in some way, shape and form. I'm curious, since this is the first time that we're connecting with one another and you're being introduced to the Children's Book Spotlight series audience, when was it, was it a specific moment in time or a series of moments? When was it that you first knew that your mission, your purpose, uh, you know, many people use the word Dharma, when did you know that that was for the children and being able to create these these wonderful children's books to be able to make uh, a positive impact in the lives of children around the world? Thank you. Uh, great question. I knew for sure when I was a senior in high school, um, I was a part of a classroom called Teacher Cadet, and we had an assignment to create a picture book that we would read um, to little ones. Um, I created my first picture book then called The Big Big Book of Busy Busy Bees. And it was a literal big book. And I did the illustrations, which I'm not an illustrator, but I did the illustrations anyway. Uh, but I realized then that I there was so much joy in that and so much joy in being able to share that book with little ones. I knew one day I would get back to writing picture books because I was already a writer of poetry. I tried my hand at a few different books, but I just knew I enjoyed writing. Uh, but I didn't know for sure about picture books until that moment happened my senior year of high school, many decades ago, almost two decades ago. And then, and it's really cool to know that really early on that you had a connection because, you know, for, for some authors, for some illustrators, it can be a matter of, you know, there's an experience that happens in later, later in life. And uh, oftentimes when, you know, little ones come into the world, you know, with us and through us, that can also provide some inspiration as well too. It, it's very easy because you're, you're a very successful author and, and many people that tune into the children's book spotlight series, whether it be their entrepreneurs, their aspiring authors, maybe there's just people that want to be able to try something new. It's very easy to say, Antoine Edy, I see his work everywhere. He has, you know, the golden toilet seat, so to speak, right? That everything is working out. It's all Shangri-La in your world, so to speak. Undoubtedly, you've experienced some challenges, difficulties, obstacles, problems, stressors, troubles, worries. I alphabetize those because they kind of have the same kind of energy to it. It's like, wah, wah, wah. We obviously want yes. to be right here, but life, we really have to experience the contrast so that we can, we can, you know, we can really enjoy things that much more. And even when we're experiencing some challenges, we can give ourselves grace and compassion and empathy along the way. Specifically, what were some of the challenges of note, the difficulties of note that you experienced on your path early on and even throughout the course of your career? And then what were some of the things that helped you to get through to the other side of those? Yeah, so starting out, I didn't know anything about how to become an author. So when I set off to go to college, I initially was uh, majoring in things that were practical, um, science. I'm the youngest of six in my family and the first to graduate from college. So in that, I knew I didn't want to get to college and just say, oh, I'll become an author one day because I had never met an author at that point. I didn't know anything about traditional publication and I definitely never heard of literary agents or the big five. Um, so getting to college, it was all science, but I continued to write poetry. I continued to enter um, poetry contests and these creative writing contests that I would actually win. So I knew it was always there and I knew there was something special. I knew I had something to offer in this space. Uh, but again, I didn't see myself um, as an author because I had never met an author, especially a black author. Um, fast forward, it wasn't until 2019 where I met a young black author for the very first time and that allowed me to turn this far-fetched dream into an attainable goal by lit literally seeing the manifestation of what I wanted to become standing right there in front of me. Uh, and it was a beautiful thing. And I started back writing then, which 2019, a few years ago, I was writing on and off. Um, at the time, I had just moved to Savannah, Georgia, maybe like two years, three years before that. Um, and I was just working. I was working in animal medicine, going through the day-to-day -day process, as we call the young adulting, 
where you have, you know, life is happening and you have to make money. So that's what I was doing. But when I met him by the name of Nana Kwame Ajebrenya, when I met him, the author of Friday Black, I said, I can do this. I can do this because he's doing this. And this is what I want. I want to do this. And even though he is a novelist and a short story writer, I just knew that in my heart, I wanted to do picture books. And I went back to 2007 when I was at senior in high school and wanted, wanting to write picture books and falling in love with picture books. But throughout those years, I was gifting picture books um, for nieces and nephews. At that time, my friends from undergrad were having little ones of their own. So I said, you know what? There's something here that I love. Um, the challenges. The challenges were not knowing anything, anything about the industry. Publishing is a mystery. And I've since learned that there are ways to demystify the publishing process. Um, but coming from my part of South Carolina, where we didn't have an author, had never met an author, this was something that felt so unattainable, so far-fetched, so movie. I've only seen it in movies, right? But I just woke up after meeting Nana Kwame and I said, you know what, I'm going to write picture books. And I started writing them thinking like so many people think I could just wake up and write a picture book. I could not. Um, I continued to write. And when I was ready to actually query agents after studying picture books, reading hundreds of picture books a week, um, I was then rejected over 150 times. So my debut, Nigel and the Moon, was actually my fourth or fifth picture book. It was just the first to be published um, because, again, over 150 agents rejected me. And then when I had a manuscript that was good enough to get three agent offers, so I had three agents who wanted to work with me, I selected one agent. When I started working with that agent, we were ready to submit to publishers. However, that book that was good enough to get the interest, to garner the interest of three agents, wasn't good enough to get publishers uh, to notice. So I was then rejected by every publisher. So I just kept going, kept going. The thing that helped me continue to go was looking at the stats of black characters in picture books and knowing that there are more animals in picture books um, than there were black characters. Um, then the highest demographic were white characters. Um, but then also the majority of the books at that time, and it still may be the case, uh, majority of the books with black characters on the cover or in the story as the main character weren't written by black people or black authors or had black illustrators, which I doesn't mean that it has to be, but I wanted to balance the shelves a little bit more. In my mind, I wondered why that was, because I know so many brilliant people that write so many brilliant black writers, but what happened to them where they chose to self-publish versus going into the traditional, traditional publication route? Um, and I wanted to figure that out. And then I learned you know, there are gatekeepers. There are these other things that publishers may say um, about the audience, um, you know, that so many of us are writing for. And I've learned then that I knew what I was up against. So I said, okay, I have to keep going. And I always tell people to, to just start where you are. And that's how I got out of my own way by starting where I was, just to keep going. I give you a lot of credit as well, too, because, you know, perseverance is is key. And again, being able to know the fact that you you had a dream, you had a vision, you had a goal. I love the use of the word manifestation as well, too, because it's a matter of like, this may seem woo-woo to certain people, but not really in the aspect that if there's something that we want to be able to bring into our lives, we want to be able to create, it, it's a matter of, you know, moving through the fears and the insecurities, really stepping into the highest and best version of ourselves in the process. We hope that you're enjoying this wonderful conversation that we're having, this trolley step, as we like to call here on the Children's Book Spotlight Series. We're spending some quality time with our newest friend and neighbor, Antoine Eady. We're about ready to dive into the pages of his brand new children's book, The Last Stand, courtesy of our friends and neighbors at Penguin Random House. You can head on over to Antoine's official website, which we have included in the description below. In addition, you can head on over to Amazon.com if that's your preferred online vehicle of your choosing. One of the many ways you can pledge your support for Antoine and his great illustrating team, Jarrett and Jerome Humphrey. And of course, we're going to be talking again more about their work as well as part of the story. You can, of course, leave a five-star review because, again, that's one of the many ways you can pledge your support to let all three of them know that they're doing wonderful and magical work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books for all educators 
across the country if you would like to be able to facilitate your own in-person or virtual remote author school visit with Antoine during the spring or during the back to school season you can connect with him via his official website and of course if you prefer to be able to support your favorite big 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 bookstores be sure to not forget your favorite local libraries and your favorite children's and independent bookstores as we like to say here on the children's book spotlight series they truly are the pillars of our community. In terms of the origin story of The Last Stand, so there's always two origin stories when it comes to a children's book. There is the, the author's origin story, and then there's the origin story of this particular book. And, and I'm fascinated when I had the chance to be introduced to The Last Stand and read the story, this is something that I had no idea about. And knowing mm. the fact in, in the research that I did, the fact that there was a time where there was a large number of black farmers and they were a huge part of bringing all of the crops into the world. And, you know, in, in many respects, that's shifted. And now it's a very small percentage in terms of what that actually was before. And I can, I can feel through the book the passion that you have for this, knowing the fact that there is people like me that had no idea about the plight of Black farmers. Could you share with us before we dive into the pages of the story, when you were first introduced to this, when you knew, when did you know that The Last Stand was something that really needed to take precedence and really get out there so that not only more people could be aware of their journey and their story, but to be able to have this particular story be shared for the current generation and for generations of children to come so that ultimately Black farmers are not forgotten? Absolutely. Um, so this is one of those moments where I know for sure my entire life was leading up to this moment. I mentioned earlier that um, when I was a senior in high school, I wrote my first picture book at that same time when a few of us, a few of us were applying to colleges. I had a friend, um, a really good friend who I'm still friends with to this day, who wanted to set off and farm with his grandfather. And I, I tried to discourage him. I said, there's only a few of us that are getting out of our area and actually going to college. You have the grades to go to college. Why not just go to college? But he knew that he wanted to farm with his grandfather. Fast forward so many years later before I had even entertained the idea of writing a children's book about farmers. Um, when I finally started, when I got into the industry and I was writing stories, I thought back, I thought about my hometown. I'm from a small town um, in South Carolina's low country um, near like Beaufort, South Carolina. We're a self-sustaining community, meaning in our particular area, we don't have a grocery store that we can walk to like a few blocks to get to. We don't have one that we can just drive five minutes to. Uh, a lot of the, and we don't have like convenience stores either. So a lot of what we did for fresh produce it, it was us, it was the community that created these things. We had someone that grew watermelons. We had someone that grew corn. We knew someone who had sweet potatoes. We knew someone who was raising chickens and cows and, and that's how we sustained, that's how we maintained in our area where, so if you could go on the side of the road, you may see um, a red truck on the side of the road and we knew that that was the fruit man who was selling fresh produce. He has sugar cane, watermelon, depending on the season. Um, same thing where we had people who would drive around the neighborhood to figure out who needed what. Um, and it was always a beautiful thing that I grew up with, assuming that those kind of communities were natural and normal. Um, it wasn't until getting out of that community that I realized that it wasn't, um, that not everyone had that experience. And secondly, not everyone had that experience with Black farmers. So I knew one day I would tell this story. I think it was in 2019 when I wrote down in my the app of my phone, the notes app, I said, farmers, um, something about the last stand. And I knew I would revisit this story, but it wasn't until the height of the pandemic that I said, I need to revisit this story now. One, we saw that how much we relied on our farmers. There were food shortages in so many areas, supply chain issues. People definitely didn't have access to a lot of fresh uh, produce, but also, the farmer's markets on Saturdays were for me, it, it was peaceful, it was, it was solace. It felt like such a safe space because it was, an, it was one of the few places we could go that wasn't, um, you know, we could still socially distance, 
we could breathe in fresh air, we could say hi to neighbors still, and you know, it was something beautiful because here in Savannah, Georgia, we were under a curfew. So if I wasn't going to work, at that time I was working in animal medicine, if I wasn't going to work, then I was just home. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't one of those moments where we could like actually see other people, except for those Saturdays at the farmer's markets. And that combined with hearing the stories about food shortages, um, I knew then that, hey, that story that you were going to write about farmers, you need to write it now. This is the time because you need to, one, send out an apology to farmers, but also thank the farmers that are here today for what they're doing. That's beautiful. And it's, it's something, again, that, you know, I was, I was fascinated to learn more about. And one of the frustrating things that, that we can experience both individually and collectively is, is that the only way in which people are remembered if their is if their stories are continued to be passed on from generation to generation and there are there are you know groups of people that are just cast off to the side and forgotten about and you're absolutely right you know during the pandemic we experienced as you said the food shortages the supply sh chain issues it seems like there was you know i remember when like there was no paper towels right like you remember the yeah. time no paper towels right but being able to share this this story it tackles something very important and in many respects you know the world of children's literature can seem like rainbows and gumdrops so, but obviously this was a very this necess, i mean it obviously is kind of rainbows and gumdrops energy but it's something that's very powerful it's a story that really needed to be shared now in terms of connecting with jared and jerome this has to be even more of a special project knowing the fact that it's like you have two strong African-American illustrators who are, the, who are the top of their game. There's you at the top of their game. How important was it for you? Because, I mean, I can only imagine that there's probably, you know, uh, young Black men and, and women, boys and girls that are coming up to you and saying, wow, I can do that. I can be an author. I can be an illustrator. Or they probably have said, I, I had no idea about the farmers that came before us. Before we dive more into the pages, just talk about the experience of working together with Jared and Jerome and bringing this story to life, knowing the fact that it was going to help to keep the memory and the legacy alive of Black farmers, but also inspire the current and the next generation at the same point in time. What did that mean to you? Oh, that means everything. It's one of those moments that I'm still processing because Jared and Jerome actually, um, they were a dream collaboration for me. One that I did not expect to happen this early in my career. Uh, when I was first getting into the industry or trying to get into the industry, um, they had just released a book titled The Old Truck. And it's one of my favorite, it's, it's going to be a classic. Um, it's one of my favorite picture books to this day of all time. And that book is actually one that made me say, it's possible for me to tell my story because people across the U.S., people across the world can still see themselves themselves somewhere in this story. So in a way, the old truck gave me permission to be able to tell the stories about my upbringing and the people in the community that I grew up in. So when um, The Last Stand went to auction, meaning my agent sent it out and several publishers, 10 exactly, were interested in acquiring this book. 10 wanted to buy it. Um, that was a beautiful, overwhelming process. Uh, we eventually decided on uh, Knopf Books for Young Readers with the amazing Road to Moscovich. And all, all of those publishers, majority of them had Jared and Jerome as potential illustrators. And I was excited about that because before we finally made a decision to go with Rotem, I had already seen Jared and Jerome's name come up several times. And thankfully, Rotem said the same thing. She had um, them on their list. And I was excited about that, super honored. And then the only thing then was to see if they were willing to illustrate it because illustrators don't have to agree to illustrate the author's book. And at that time, Jared and Jerome had, they weren't really illustrating for other people. They were just, you know, putting out their own works. Um, so I waited, waited for them to say yes. They did say yes. And it was just amazing from there. But it was special for me for a few reasons with Jared and Jerome ha having ties to Texas they also have ties to the farming community. So it's something that they're already familiar with. Um, and then they also have ties, like Jared and Jerome are two of four boys. So they're brothers. 
I'm the youngest of six, but I have three other brothers. So there's four boys in my family. And there was just all of these unique ties, aside from the, just being black men, that just felt so aligned, so right, so fitting for this time. And I, yeah, I'm super grateful for them. And everything that they did with this book is every, like, I couldn't have imagined it. It's what I imagined and beyond. And I'm super thankful. Um, there's a little nugget um, at, on that last spread there where you see what's happening and I won't give the spoilers away, but um, there's a mention of someone who's near and dear to Jared and Jerome's um, heart and their family too, who is also an actual farmer. And it's a special thing that they were able to include there. So yes, yeah, very special. This was a touching, touching collaboration. One of the favorite times that we experience during a children's book spotlight series is when we like to say we crack the cover and we dive into the pages of the children's book that we are sharing and showcasing and featuring on the children's book spotlight series. And we never like to give away the whole kitten caboodle. That's probably like an old school vaudevillian term, like the kitten caboodle, right? Obviously, we want to be able to encourage children, parents, families, educators, and as we like to say, those who love great children's books to enjoy the story. Could you share with us without giving away the whole kitten caboodle a little bit more about the story itself? Because it really has a strong family connection. You have a little boy and he's going to work alongside his father. And it's just, you, you see that father-son bond, you see the family bond, that there, there's so many different things besides just talking about the plight of black farmers that The Last Stand talks about and discusses. Could you share this a little bit more about the story and some of the specific things that children, parents, and families will take away from the story, some of the key themes and messages you feel are of note. Absolutely. So The Last Stand um, is a story about a young boy and his grandfather who have The Last Stand at the farmer's market in a community that needs them um, as much as they need that community. And that's the beautiful story on the surface level. What I did was take the pain of our world, and I mentioned this in my author's note, and turned it into something beautiful. And that's what we see with The Last Stand on the surface level. Just a beautiful story about a young boy who's learning to serve his community through his grandfather. And then we also see how that community also serves grandfather when he needs them too. Um, it begins, if you don't mind, I can just read a little few sentences here. Sure. Is, is that okay? All right. So it begins. Papa has the last stand. It wasn't always this way. A year ago, there were two. The year before, five. On Saturdays, we harvest, Papa and I. Papa gathers peppers, plums, and pumpkins. I collect the eggs. So yes, this is what we see. It's just a beautiful Saturday routine between a young boy and his grandfather. But what I love that I did here, and that was um, after a friend of mine who was reading this manuscript, she saw a pattern. I had already mentioned some colors, um, like gray and black and blue. And she said, you know what you should do here? Introduce the, all of the colors, the primary colors that young, young dreamers, I call them young dreamers, that little ones are being introduced to around this age. So classrooms, teachers, you can see the orange pumpkins, you can see the white eggs, you can see all of these beautiful things that are mentioned. And that's what I love here. There's a little side effect that just happened. But all of these beautiful things that are happening in the story that you can actually take into the classroom and outside of the classroom. So that's why I mentioned a lot of primary colors. So that little ones that are learning their colors, they can say green. Oh, yeah, these peppers. Purple. Yes, these plums. Orange. Oh, yeah, that pumpkin. And uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, it's just a beautiful story um, that little ones can walk away from. And, and you can take this book to the farmer's market with them. And, you know, they can look at farmers and see, oh, so there was a journey. This plum went on a journey before it got to me. These eggs didn't just manifest here, didn't pop up here. No, this, these eggs were on the farm with chickens and someone had to gather these eggs and bring them to me. So it's a beautiful journey. It's a field trip, I think. Um, that little ones can go on with their parents, with their guardians, um, with their teachers, librarians, and so many other people. There's, again, as I mentioned, so many messages that are found within the course of, of the book. And maybe this is 
there, there's like multiple minds and hearts I feel that are kind of working individually and collectively within me. So there is, you know, my inner child who loves children's books. There's the PR publicity mind of me where it's like, okay, there's this and there's this and this is awesome and it connects with this and whatnot. And there's just someone that just loves to take the time to be able to just relax and to be able to enjoy something very special. And two of the things that I wanted to be able to share that I love about The Last Stand is the fact that it's not only just teaching children, but reminding us of the little things that really mean a lot, the appreciation for that. You know, during the pandemic, we were able to, you know, I, I always like to say one of the silver linings during the dark time that was the pandemic, children, parents, and families could spend more time together. And things yes. slow down at the same point in time. And that's the second thing that I also really love about The Last Stand is because just coming off of the heels of my recent business trip to New York City and spending some quality time with our friends and neighbors at the Kidlit TV studios in the Tribeca of New York City, honk, honk, beep, beep. Honk, honk, beep, beep. Everyone needs to get somewhere five minutes ago, right? And there's always this, this rushing. Now, one of the great things about living out here in San Diego and Southern California is that it's more of a chill kind of vibe. So thus you can do more in the being. But when you take the time to go to farmer's markets in San Diego, like it, it's interesting. You, this book has actually inspired me to spend more quality time on Saturdays with the local farmer's markets because we have some of the best farmer's markets in the entire country. Right. And to be able to take that time, slow down, put down the to do list and just enjoy all of that. I love cooking on mind of things. I love cooking vegetables as well, too. And it's very easy to go to the Ralph's or the Vons or the Sprouts or the Wegmans or the uh, Publix, whatever your favorite grocery store is of your choosing. Right. And just go in because everything is there at the grocery store or your Targets or your Walmarts, whatever the case might be. But when you're also going to farmer's markets, you're also pledging your support for them. So you mentioned in the story how it's like you went from one, you went from five farmers market, five farmer stands only down to one. One. And so it's a matter of like when we pledge our support, we can do our our part to be able to give back. And that's also one of the other themes as well, too, that I really love about the story as well, because it's important when we are blessed with success. And this will be another thread that we'll come back to. So we'll put a pin in that and circle back with that. But the importance is, is that when we're, when we have the opportunity to be very blessed and very fortunate, the importance of paying that forward and giving that back in the process. We are beginning to wind down our time with our featured guest here on episode number 202 of the Children's Book Spotlight series, award-winning children's author Antoine Edie. We're fully immersed. We're fully enjoying The Last Stand, as you can clearly tell here on this very special trolley stop that is episode number 202 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. We encourage all of you, our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and of course, our fellow shining stars, to head on over to Antoine's official website. He keeps it easy. His first name, his last name, dot com, Antoine Edie dot com. You can also head on over to amazon.com if that's your your favorite online vehicle of your choosing or your favorite big box stores if you'd like to be able to check it out there when you head on over to amazon be sure to leave a five-star review if you feel called and guided to do so that's one of the many ways that you can pledge your support for antoine to let him know that he's doing wonderful and much needed work for children parents families educators and those who love great children's books for all educators across the country you can schedule your virtual or in-person author school visit with Antoine during the spring or hard to believe the back to school season will be just around the corner very shortly. You can head on over to his official website and connect with him in that fashion. And again, we also encourage all of you to continue to support our the pillars of our community, your favorite local children's and independent bookstores and your favorite local libraries. If they do not stock their copy of The Last Stand or Nigel and the Moon, and we'll be circling back with that on that thread momentarily. As we like to say, you don't like to make demands, right? When you go to the local libraries or the favorite children's or independent bookstores, you give a little tip of the cap. You, you do that kind of thing, right? And say that you heard about The Last Stand here on PR from the Hearts Children's Book Spotlight series. I'm always curious to learn, you know, when, when we take the time to experience something and we create something, there's always a lot that we learn about ourselves. What is it that the experience of creating, co-creating The Last Stand and bringing this book into the world what has this taught you about yourself and what has this taught you about life? 
Thank you. And I also want to thank you too for just taking as much time with the last stand as you have and, and having such brilliant questions. What has this process taught me? That this is, I knew this was my work, but now I know for sure that being a vessel for the pain that can sometimes come from our world, it is my duty to serve as a vessel for that pain to make beauty out of it. Um, and it's something similar that I did for Nigra in the Moon. It's something I've done for a few of my other stories. The harsh truth, the truth that a lot of us um, either don't know about, that I have just so happen to learn about. And then I'm like, okay, I'm feeling this way. Now, what can I do with that feeling? And the last stand is an answer for that because the, the truth about farming, farming in America as a whole, and then the truth about farming as a black farmer in America as as um, a whole is also they're so it can be tough it can be a tough discussion to have it can be a tough realization so i realized that this is actually my work i'm happy to do it i'm happy to do it happy to talk about it and i'm thankful that i can actually make beauty out of it i can give life and meaning to something um again and it's not me starting this conversation about black farmers or farmers in general, it's me continuing that conversation. So I'm happy to just lend my voice in this space. Um, and yeah, that, that is, that's that been the true honor here is just, wow, you really created something from a, a, a realization that used to make you cry. It would make me teary-eyed when I was researching and learning more and more. Um, it was also a way of, you know, me apologizing to the younger me and to my classmate at the time who said, I want to go farm with my grandfather. And now he's one of the most prominent farmers in South Carolina. So if you fast forward almost, it's been over like 14, 15 years since we had that discussion when I was getting ready to go off to college, fast forward all of these years later, and he was one of the first that I told, I was writing this story. So immediately, as soon as sketches came in, I would send him sketches. And you know, and I was just like, I'm thankful that he didn't give up on it, that he did farm with his grandfather, that his grandfather, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but now South Carolina still has a farmer, and then they have a Black farmer. My hometown has a farmer, and he doesn't just serve our hometown, he serves uh, areas throughout South Carolina. So it's been a beautiful thing, you know, and timing is everything too, um, but I'm happy that I was able to just be a vessel. We always love to be able to provide useful and supportive information, tips, tools, strategies for parents, for caregivers, for grandparents, for educators, so that they can immediately take away, not only for, for themselves after watching a children's book spotlight series episode, but to be able to instill it in the minds and hearts of their children, their grandchildren, their students. Mm. We go back to the theme, the anthem of episode number 202 of the children's book spotlight series, and that is harvesting hope and not only harvesting hope but harvesting love what are some simple ways but yet meaningful ways that we can do our part as parents caregivers custodians of our young ones our our, our young hearts to be able to instill more hope and more love so that they know that they can not only just do whatever it is they, that they want to be able to do in life, but so that they can enjoy life more in the process. What are a few things that specifically come to mind for you, Antoine? Allow little ones, and I've never been asked this question before, but I love that. Allow young dreamers to cultivate their passions. I always say that had I dreamt a thousand dreams, my parents would have supported me a thousand times. And that is the truth. My parents were willing when I had an interest in chemistry, they purchased chemistry sets for me. When I wanted to be a writer, they encouraged me to do writing. They even said, you know how to write. When I was getting ready to change my major, my senior year of college, that would have put me back two years. My mom said, you know how to write, go ahead and write and get the degree and still write, you know how to do this. You don't have to put yourself behind another two years or two years, just go ahead and write. Um, but so they always encourage me, they encourage me to explore. And this coming from parents who did not graduate from college, who did not have other children at the time who graduated from college because I'm the youngest of six. So all of this was new to them. Me, I was a first generation college student getting up there to my university 
um, learning about the things I was learning about, all of it was new, but they never discouraged me. They only encouraged me to keep going. And that's why I said, if I wanted to be a beekeeper, my parents would have been right there making sure that I knew how to keep the hives. Uh, there is an interest because I love, I'm from the country, the dirt roads of South Carolina, when I had an interest in, in animals. My, my dad, for one of my birthdays, he bought me a, uh, an infrared camera that we could set out in the woods so that I could see all of the wildlife that would come across the trails. And we would set up like corn for the deer and, and, and coyotes and everything. Um, but they always encouraged me. And unfortunately, as of like six years, my parents are no longer here. Um, they're no longer with us, but it's been a beautiful thing. So they never saw Niger in the moon. They never saw me as an author. Uh, but I know for sure they saw this life for me long before I could see it for myself. So even though they couldn't physically see it, they aren't here to physically see it. That's what keeps me going is knowing that that they know they knew that this life was coming for me. So much so that my mom uh, said it a week before, um, you know, she unexpectedly passed. She said, Swan, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to do something special with your writing. And at the time I wasn't writing anymore because I had just graduated and I was just trying to, I was working animal medicine, which I love, but I was just going through the, you know, the drudging through the drudgery, I guess. I was just going through the day by day to make sure one, I could pay my bills and that, you know, live and exist. And yeah, she just randomly told me one day that she knew I was going to do something special with my writing. I, there's there's a term that we use regularly here on the program, and my my condolences on the on the on the passing, the transition of your parents is, is the fact that uh, we use the term shining stars here on the program, and with PR from the heart. And there's there's no doubt in my mind that your mom knew that you were a shining star, a very very bright shining star. And it's just so awesome to see how your star is becoming brighter and brighter in the process. And it's interesting because when we talk about stars, we also have to talk about the moon as well too. And it's fitting that the premiere, the release of your children's book spotlight series episode is tied into the March full moon. And, and I'm always curious because I always feel that there's something magical. There's always magic that happens during a full moon. I remember this was probably around like 2015, 2016. There was a time in my life where I kind of thought like when there's full moons that like, because statistically speaking, energy is higher, emotions are higher, feelings are higher. And, you know, people can kind of be a little bit on edge. So it's kind of a little like, it felt like I was walking on eggshells during full moons. Now it's like the quite the opposite. It's like, I look up to the sky and I have the relationship where I can call the full moon La Luna. What is it specifically that you feel about the moon? Because obviously this ties into the connection with Nigel and the moon. And obviously that was, you know, the big break that you had on your end of things to be able to bring you to this particular point in time. What is it about the moon that makes it so special? If you can really encapsulate that into, into words. Yeah, um, thank you. So Nigel and the moon is a story about a young boy who's afraid to tell the world his dreams, so he shares them with the moon at night. And it's brilliantly illustrated by Gracie Zhang. Um, when I was younger, on my parents' porch in South Carolina, which majority of the times that area would be pitch black, um, we had a few like light poles here and there, but it's we're surrounded by trees, so it's a very dark area. area. Um, but I would sit on my parents' porch and I would stare at the moon, so much so that my parents would purchase a, a telescope for me. Every other Christmas, I would get a new telescope. And it goes back to, you know, had I dreamt a thousand dreams, my parents would have supported me a thousand times. And these were people who, my parents weren't looking at the moon. They weren't like, you know, looking through telescopes, but they saw that I had an interest in it and they did what they could to, to provide for me in that way. Um, you know, the night, I think about this oftentimes where it could have been an older sibling that Nigel had. It could have been Nigel and the big brother or Nigel and The Notebook, where Nigel wrote down his hopes and fears and dreams, but instead it's the moon. I think there's a beautiful connection that we have to the moon. In particular, um, I'm what they call Gullah Geechee. We are the um, descendants of enslaved West Africans, predominantly West Africans, and we exist along the, the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And our group of people are ones that have maintain the most African retentions. So a lot of things that were brought over from Africa from how we prepare our foods to the crabbing and shrimping and that process of what we do, the way we live off the land, um, our people do that often. And 
you can see it um, when you look at Africa and then compare it to what we have today. So we believe with our bodies being a lot, our bodies being made up of a lot of water, there's something, something calming about water. And even with the tide going in and out that the moon affects, I think that's why it all, I think it's all aligned and it's all tied together. It's all connected, but I've always felt safe with the moon. When I always use that telescope, I was actually able to dream like Nigel. I would pretend to be all of these things. And along our dirt road at night, when I would walk down that road and the moon was lighting my path, I, I, would, I would wish, sometimes it was something superficial, like, oh, I wish my parents would get me that new, like gummy candy maker. Like, I, and that's the like, actual memory I had where there was this like Power Rangers candy maker that like could make these gummies. And I literally remember walking down our path and looking at the moon and just wishing on that. Um, and I didn't realize it then, but the moments I would sit on my parents' porch and look at the moon, it was offering a safe space for me. It was a place where I could dream and not have anyone pull those dreams down. It was a place for me where I could think without feeling judged. And again, I didn't have the language for it, but that's that distance between the moon and myself that darkness, that darkness represented a safe space. So with Nigel and the moon, I wanted to offer a safe space to so many of us that need it and to recognize the safe spaces in our own worlds, be it the few seconds we have when we walk from our doorstep to the bus stop. Sometimes that's a safe space. The, it could be the library. It could be the moments we have in a corner of our bedroom or in our closet. There's so many different safe spaces that we may have. And I wanted to offer Nigel safe space, but also allow young dreamers to find their own safe spaces. I love that. And I, I feel that, again, there is some, <clears throat> some, something magical that, you know, oftentimes we can't put it into words, the connection that we have with, with the full moon. But it's a matter of, as you've, you've coined it, you know, young dreamers being able to look up to the sky and just have that conversation with, with the moon and like, you get that that solace. You get that that knowing, that nudging, that everything is going to be okay, and that you're going to be able to ascend for. Because we're always doing our part to become the highest and best versions of ourselves. The the two is that we always close out every featured children's book spotlight series episode. Antoine, we always like to give a little tip of the cap to one of our favorite neighbors, of course, Mr. Rogers, the host of the long running popular children's television program on PBS, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And in many respects, he did this not only on the program. But throughout his time, when he was traveling across the country, when he spoke at various universities and colleges and talks, even in my uh, one of my times that I went to the Fred Rogers Institute in Latrobe doing some research on Fred, um, I learned the fact that like in the early 90s, he had like a talk in front of the American Library Association. So like, you know, many people know like his, you know, big talks, but, you know, he literally traveled across the country and talked to so many people. Most notably, he did this shortly before he passed from his from stomach cancer when he received his lifetime achievement award at the daytime emmys he encouraged all of us to re and he always kept the time whether it be 15 seconds 30 seconds or a full minute he always encouraged us to remember those who helped love us into being mm. and that was his way of helping us to remember those people who came across our path to uh to not only feed our bellies but feed our souls in the process who inspired us to harvest hope and to harvest love and to be able to experience community and togetherness that much more i know that you obviously mentioned your your family your mom and your dad on your end of things um and undoubtedly they've helped love you into being um who are some of the other people that you would like to publicly recognize here in episode number 202 of the children's book spotlight series that have helped love you antoine edie into being Oh, that is beautiful. Um, number one, I know you mentioned my parents, but that is undoubtedly like that. I have to say it, it's, it's them, um, especially my mom, because my mom was a person who did not give up. She uh, was just so strong and, and brilliant. And how you mentioned um, her knowing that I was a rising star. It was one of those moments where she told me, um, she said, my nickname is Tuan. So she would say, Tuan, not everyone wakes up every day feeling like you feel that they're meant for something super, super big. Um, and she said, you know, my her biggest dream for us, because my mom was the youngest of six and the first and her siblings to graduate from high school. 
So she said, my biggest dream for all six of my children were to make sure that I got you all through high school. And that's exactly what she did. And now we all do amazing things, but she got us through high school. And that was a big dream for her. Um, the other people that have inspired me, oh, so many teachers, so many teachers, especially um, the Black English teachers I've had. Um, Mr. Gordon, Kareem Gordon, who allowed me to see a Black man in this space who loved literature. That was a big deal for me. Um, my cousins who uh, would be reading when I was out playing basketball, I would jump and play, I would play basketball, ride my four wheeler, but then I would take time to go on my aunt and uncle's porch to just read with them for a little while. And uh, their names are Jamesha and Cinderella, but they would read. And that told me then, as much as they love reading, I was like, there's something here. There's something here. Um, but you know what? I've been fortunate enough to have been surrounded by so many people that I would do a disservice by only naming a few. I felt, I feel like life has been aligned in a way for me to have met some of the most amazing people who have poured into me, including publishing with my, my agent, Steve Mock, with my editors, Mabel Sue, Rota Moskovich, and so many others who have just poured into me and uh, spoken life into me. So this, it's a tough question because I can't just name, I don't have just a few I can name, so many people I can say along this journey have poured into me. And I, I believe, and, and thank you for sharing all, all those wonderful people. And I believe it was Fred that said that um, no matter where those individuals are, if they are near or far, if they are still with us walking this earthly plane or watching down from heaven, they are smiling, knowing the positive impact, the indelible impact that mm. you have made not only on yourself, but also in the lives of many in the process. Uh, we're, we're also huge Disney buffs here on the Children's Book Spotlight series. And that always reminds us that we have the ability to bring to form and shape. And we talked about this earlier, our dreams, our desires, our goals, our ambitions. We have the abilities to help others that come onto our path do the same, whether it be family, friends, colleagues, clients. We have the ability to fulfill our own wishes. Uh, we go back to the year 1992. It was a wonderful year. We remember the late Robin Williams, who, of course, uh, voiced the genie of the lamp in Disney's beloved animated classic, Aladdin. And this inspires one of our favorite segments in the program called Three Wishes. And we actually have this tried and trusted genie lamp that has been with us uh, since day one here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series. has racked up a lot of mileage, but still looks very golden in the process. You have given freely from your heart to children, parents, families, educators, those who love great children's books and beyond throughout the course of your life. So this is your time to receive, Antoine. And it is also, again, you know, when, when you wait, when you make wishes and there's that full moon charged energy, greater chance of those wishes coming true as well. So what are your three wishes? What are the three things that you would like to be able to, and, and they can be for yourself, they can be for the children of the world, they can be for for the planet, what would your three wishes be? Ooh, that is great. Um, for myself, I wish to continue to do great work in literature and, and with platforms that continue to inspire, to change and save lives. I hope to do this forever. Um, my wish for the world is that we do harvest hope. Uh, it is, it's tough. It's a battle sometimes when you go night and day and sometimes it can feel like the world is trying its hardest to make you give up or make you quit. And I hope that wherever and whenever people feel that way, that there's something, there's a little, I call it the tiny beautiful thing in their lives that they can notice, that they can recognize to say, you know what, I, I gotta keep going. So my wish is for us all to recognize the tiny beautiful things in our lives when we need them the most. My third wish is that we all receive the secret desires of our hearts. And hopefully those desires are beautiful things that continue to enhance the world around us and the people around us, that we leave people and places better than we find them. So I hope and wish that we receive the secret desires of our hearts and do good with it. Those are beautiful wishes, Antoine. And it's also long since been said that when, when one's wishes comes from one's heart, there's also a greater chance of those wishes coming true in the process. 
Raise your hand if you have had fun on episode number 202 of the Children's Book Spotlight series. We see hands from Antoine, hands from myself, hands from the little ones on screen. As, as we like to say, that means mission accomplished, job well done. One of the fastest growing endorsements in the world of children's literature. And of course, my faithful furry friend and companion, Little Force. He's chilling right now. He's enjoying a nice rest on his end of things and also enjoying a nice collagen treat as well. Whenever he loves a children's book, as we take the time to read together regularly and, and even more so than often, he gives two paws up for The Last Stand. And again, that is one of the fastest growing endorsements in the world of children's literature. Little Forrest has only been with us for about 17, 18 months or so, but you know, many, many more books that he'll be giving two paws up to. But for this particular trolley stop, he is proudly endorsing The Last Stand. We encourage again, all of you our listeners and viewers, our friends and neighbors, and of course our fellow shining stars to head on over to Antoine's official website, AntoineED.com. We also encourage you to head on over to Amazon.com if that is your preferred online vehicle of your choosing and leave a five-star review for The Last Stand if you feel called and guided to do so. One of the many ways that you can pledge your support for Antoine is by leaving a five-star review that'll, that lets him know that he's doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books. We also encourage you to proudly support your favorite local uh, children's and independent bookstores and your favorite local libraries. Remember, remember to make that kind recommendation to stock The Last Stand if you do not happen to see that there in the process for all educators across the country and around the world for that matter. If you want to be able to facilitate your own virtual or in-person author school visit with Antoine this spring or during the upcoming back to school season, you can also head on over to his official website as well too. As we hear the trolley, that means that it is time to go. But fear not, there are many more magical trolley stops to come. We are, of course, um, going to be immersed in our spring season. There's really no off season here on the Children's Book Spotlight Series, as you can tell. Five and a half years, you know, 200 plus episodes. But there are some really super, super awesome episodes that we have forthcoming as well. If you are a children's or middle grade author and would love to share your inspiring story, and the release of your brand new children's book on a forthcoming edition of the children's book spotlight series you can head on over to our official website prfromtheheart.com or connect with us via any of our social media platforms that you now see on screen facebook instagram and twitter slash x in the process we of course have already mentioned you know mr rogers so we do want to give a little tip of the cap to one of our favorite neighbors David Newell, of course, you remember him and you love him as the beloved Mr. McFeely on the popular long-running children's television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We know him and we love him as David Newell. We have been now doing the Neighborly Reviews Bookcast, which is the popular children's book review program, tried and true here at PR from the Heart. We love to be able to provide resources of care, especially for parents and for educators, to let them know the best children's books that are on the market from the published children's authors and the self-published children's authors, because we all put our pants on one leg at a time, as we like to say here at the Children's Book Spotlight Series. So if you are a children's author and would love David and I to give a neighborly review, to review your brand new children's book on a forthcoming edition of the Neighborly Reviews Bookcast, we encourage you to, again, connect with us via our official website, prfromtheheart.com. You can, of course, now subscribe to our official all-new monthly online newsletter to, be, to get the exclusive details before they are released on social media and forthcoming episodes of the Children's Book Spotlight series and the Neighborly Reviews Bookcast. And we are now just a few months shy of the 10-year anniversary of being of service to children's authors all across the country and all around the world. We've been very blessed and fortunate to work with some of the top people in the industry, John Parra, Catherine Roy, as well as those whose journeys are just taking flight. So if you are a children's or middle grade author and would love to facilitate your own national book media tour or facilitate even just a featured television interview in a city of your choosing, you can head on over to our official website, prfromtheheart.com, schedule your own courtesy call and let us see how we can be of service to you. One final time, we encourage you to head on over to Antoine's official website, AntoineED.com. Head on over to Amazon.com as well. You can purchase your copies of The Last Stand and Nigel and the Moon. Be sure to leave that five-star review. Again, that just reminds Antoine that he's doing wonderful and much-needed work for children, parents, families, educators, and those who love great children's books. Again, be sure to support your favorite local library, your favorite children's and independent bookstore, 
by checking out your copy of The Last Stand or purchasing it. Of course, if it's at your favorite local or children's independent bookstore, if you do not see them stock it, be sure to make that kind recommendation in the process. And again, for all educators all across the country and all around the world, you can schedule your very own in-person or virtual author school visit with Antoine by heading over to his official website. And let's keep the connection going. You can stay connected with Antoine on social media. We've included his social media platforms in the description below so that indeed we can do our part to be able to continue to keep this wonderful message flowing post children's book spotlight series. But of course, when we hear the trolley, that means that it is time to go. But we want to thank you for your continued support of PR from the heart, for your continued support of the children's book spotlight series for your continued support of children's authors and illustrators such as Antoine, who again are doing wonderful and much needed work for children, parents, families, and educators, and those who love great children's books, for the pillars of our community, local libraries and children's and independent bookstores. But above all else, we wanna thank you for helping us to walk home the children of the world. We felt his spirit throughout the course of this trolley stop, and we always close out every program with this. You know, Mr. Rogers, in many respects, in many ways, shapes and forms, he reminded us of our inherent worth and our inherent value. He reminded us of how special that we are by simply weighing the weight that he did on planet Earth. Did you know that Mr. Rogers weighed 143 pounds while he walked this earthly plane? Interestingly enough, one letter in I, four letters in love, and three letters in you. As little Forrest and as Antoine were kind enough to spend some quality time with us here on this trolley stop, and as a little tip of the cap to Mr. Rogers, we like to share our favorite three numbers of 243. There's two letters in we, four letters in love, and three letters in you. We see you. We see the creativity within you. Young dreamers, we know that there are things that you want to be able to achieve, and you can and you will. So we like you. We love you just the way that you are. We see your divine and inherent worth. And again, you are whole, you are healthy, you are complete, that you are loved, that you are special just the way that you are. So for Little Forrest, who's still enjoying a siesta, a nap on his end of things, for Antoine Edie, for myself, John Massalonis, we look forward to seeing you for more magical trolley stops here on the Children's Book Spotlight series. Thank you for helping us to walk home, the children of the world, our fellow friends, our fellow neighbors, and our fellow shining stars. Goodbye for now, and happy spring! <laughs>